little tour. I think maybe that's the kind of year it is, right? So uh, anyway, welcome to the Forest Health uh, meeting. And I don't know who all I have in front of me, but I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And so we may have uh, folks from the Forest Service, BLM, and the State Forester, which the State Forester I see. So I'm going to go with you, let you kind of take over and uh, introduce people. And if there's other people in the back that are part of your um, contingency, um, that are, would be nice to know who else is here. OK. Well, I'm going to present uh, first and foremost our speakers here. And then I, I can let them present who's all here on their behalf as well. So we have Kelly Norris. I'm the Wyoming State Forester. And with me today is our Rocky Mountain Regional Forester, Frank Bim, Intermountain Regional Deputy Forester, Chris Campbell, and Wyoming Bureau of Land Management State Forester, Heidi Rogers. Would you like us to go through each of the You, you know, that here? would be good. And first start? of all, welcome. And we appreciate you coming and, uh, and this conversation yeah. that, that happens yearly in the legislature. I think, uh, you know, I just want to make a quick statement. I am the Speaker of the House. And, uh, you know, um, I come from a county that's 80% federal land. And, uh, and much of that is forested land, and much of it is BLM sagebrush land. And uh, the policies uh, that, that, that happen on these lands affect all of us, from me as a grazer, to our oil and gas, to our recreators, to our wildlife enthusiasts. So one, we appreciate the work you do. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't have questions at times. So I, 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 I applaud you for coming. So if you would go through the back and kind of mention who's here. Okay, well, I will start here. I have the director of Office of State Lands here first, for Jennifer, Jennifer, and the deputy director, Jason Crowder. Uh, next to them is our assistant state forester, uh, fire operations, Jared DeLay. Oh, I guess Chris Fallbeck is our uh, um, AFMO, who does our Hell Attack and our aviation program. Uh, let's see. We have Harrison Brooks. He is our forest health specialist. And we have Travis Pardue, who is our shared stewardship program coordinator. And I think that's all for the state. I think Russ is behind. Hi again, Frank Bim, Regional Forester, Rocky Mountain Region, and I've got with me, and I'm not sure exactly where they're at, they can raise their hands, Forest Supervisor Andrew Johnson of the Bighorn National Forest, um, Ken Coffin of the Shoshone National Forest, Forest Supervisor, and Russ Bacon, Forest Supervisor of the Medicine Bow Route National Forest and Thunder Basin National Grasslands. Awesome. And good evening, I'm Chris Campbell, again, Deputy Regional Forester for the Intermountain Region, and we have uh, Chad Hudson, who's the forest supervisor on the Bridger Teton with us this evening. Well, I need to meet that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go two rooms down. That's the room. Please. Hello again, I'm Heidi Rogers. I'm the forestry lead for the Wyoming BLM. With me this evening, we have uh, Deputy State Director of Resources, um, Jennifer, and then we've got um, Deputy State Director of Communications, Brad Purdy, and then we've got our um, state FMO, uh, Paul Hone. Thank you. And, and you know, obviously, I, my mind has been on like that work, and now I got to shift to this. But, you know, what some of the biggest things that, that are going to go on that are important, I guess, for me and others, obviously, there's several forest plans that are about to be developed, and what comes out of those are going to be really critical to the state of Wyoming and people like me, frankly, in my area. And I think understanding how we are as uh, citizens and, and industries and legislators, how we can become involved in those processes meaningfully, I think is important as well. So State Forester, please go ahead. All right, thank you very much, Speaker. Are you ready for the Okay, provided to you today is a forest health briefing handout along with the 2023 annual report. So since it's a forest health briefing, we're gonna cover some healthy forest information here. So forest health surveying, you can go to the next slide, and monitoring is a collaborative effort between Wyoming State Forestry, federal agencies, conservation districts, and local communities. In 2023, 
over 19.3 million acres of forested lands were surveyed for forest health threats by Wyoming State Forestry and the U.S. Forest Service. Out of the 19.3 million acres flown, approximately 88,000 acres were found to have insect disease or abiotic issues, excluding fire, which is down from aerial surveys conducted in 2022. Next slide. The majority of Wyoming experienced an above average rainfall last year after three consecutive years of drought conditions. Prolonged drought often leads to increases in tree mortality caused by insects and disease. Increased precipitation likely resulted in the decrease of Wyoming's most damaging insect, the Western spruce budworm. Next slide. The Western spruce budworm continues to be Wyoming's most damaging forest pest by acreage. The Western spruce budworm is a defoliator that typically attacks Douglas fir trees of all ages and size. The highest damage can be found in the Southern Bighorns, Bridger Teton, and Shoshone National Forests. I provided a map in your handout that showcases the major insect and disease detections from the 2023 aerial flight. The next slide. You'll be able to see it much closer up on the actual um, handout. Okay, next slide. The mountain pine beetle continues to remain at endemic levels across Wyoming's forests, but mountain pine beetle killed trees are increasing statewide. Currently, mortality in Wyoming has been primarily found in the Bridger Teton and Caribou Targi National Forests. In the Black Hills, mountain pine beetle killed trees are generally found in rugged, unmanaged stands. Next slide. The Black Hills did conduct a special monitoring program this year associated with the Timber Transit Pilot Project. Due to the concern of transporting non-native insects to the Black Hills from green logs, Wyoming State Forestry, the U.S. Forest Service, and Nyman Timber Company coordinated a surveillance program with South Dakota that utilized traps in Upton and at Mills in Hewlett and Spearfish. We applaud the hard work of debarking all of the logs prior to transport, which resulted in no insects of concern identified in the traps. Next slide. Pinedale, Wyoming, ended up with an interesting invasive insect outbreak from the white satin moth. White and satin moth outbreaks are typically rare, but Pinedale did have recorded defoliation of narrow leaf cottonwood, aspen, and willow trees within and directly around the city. State forestry, Sublet County Weed and Pest, and the U.S. Forest Service are currently working on a management and control program for this insect. Next slide. For an invasive species, we are continuing to monitor with 20 communities across Wyoming for the emerald ash borer. Surveying and monitoring with city staff, conservation districts, and arborists, we have yet to confirm the emerald ash borer in Wyoming. The Japanese, bark be or the Japanese beetle <laughs> was identified in Sheridan in 2020 and has continued to be monitored, but no other findings have been confirmed outside the community of Sheridan. This invasive insect attacks a variety of trees and can be very difficult to eradicate once established in a community. There has been one positive confirmation of the spongy moth found in Park County. Further trapping is planned for this coming year to determine if any populations have been established. Shifting from forest health monitoring results, I want to give legislature an update on last year's fire season. This was our second year in a row with a below average fire season. Wyoming had 515 fires on a total of 10,789 acres. Our three EFSA fires from last season have accrued a total cost of approximately $2 million. State forestry processed 675 fire bills that included about 800 Wyoming firefighters through the fire protection revolving account. As Wyoming's fire season was slower, our Wyoming type three teams assisted in fires in Louisiana, Idaho, Montana, and Utah. State Forestry celebrated our 20th year of operation for the HELATAC program. Over the last 20 years, the HELATAC program responded to 686 incidents and had 76 forestry seasonals participate. I'd like to thank the legislature, the U.S. Forest Service, and numerous other agencies and people for all of their support with this incredibly important fire suppression program. Next slide. Our single engine air tanker program had a great fourth season of operation responding to fires within the state. The SEAT Eviation Program is a true collaboration as our federal partners at the BLM have made significant investments in the SEAT base at the Casper Airport, which is where our contract seats are located, bringing the building up to national standards. The BLM also provides funding to staff the SEAT base, which also helps support our contracted seats. Next slide. Moving from wildfire suppression, I would like to provide an update on how state forestry is helping to increase the pace and scale of active management on Wyoming's federally managed forests through the Good Neighbor Authority. 
The Good Neighbor Authority Program allows the state to partner with federal agencies to do work on federal lands by utilizing our staff's expertise and contracting system to help get more work done on the ground. Since the Good Neighbor Authority began, state forestry has contracted over 11,000 acres and sold approximately 32 million board feet of federal timber. Last year, we contracted our largest project to date, the Roughneck Timber Sale, located in the Uinta Wasatch Cache, which was 1,400 acres in size and will produce over 5 million board feet, which will go to the Wyoming Mill south in Jones. All six GNA positions were filled in 2023. These positions have become important for recruitment as we hired two of our GNA foresters as assistant district foresters last year. Next slide. The future of the GNA program is full of growth, as we have plans to complete NEPA assessment surveys through our servicing contract and system, helping to get projects developed quicker. We're also working towards forest-wide agreements with the Shoshone and Caribou Targi National Forests, bringing the total national forest with state forestry GNA agreements to seven. We're expanding our partnerships with non-governmental organizations that need help implementing management within Wyoming's only identified fire shed, which is in the Shoshone National Forest. The headwaters of the Colorado watershed that is located in the Medicine Bow Route National Forest and straddles Wyoming and Colorado has formed a bi-state collaborative, and we expect new GNA project work to be developed in this area. Beyond the use of the GNA program, state forestry has reinvigorated the shared stewardship conversation with the Forest Service Intermountain and Rocky Mountain regions, working to identify common goals and priority landscapes where we can focus on our efforts together. Shared stewardship is about acknowledging Wyoming's priorities and incorporating them into the Forest Service planning efforts with an end goal for both regions to align their actions to places we all agreed need the most work done, no matter the ownership. It is also a very timely discussion as Mr. Speaker Summers has already brought up, since each region is kicking off at least one forest plan revision with the state and state forestry plans to be actively engaged in that. Okay, next slide. State Forestry continues to support active timber management on state trust lands as well as with private landowners. Last year, we organized an interdisciplinary team and led the best management practices field audit, which reviewed the effectiveness of current BMPs through recently completed timber sales on state, private, and federal lands in the Black Hills and Bighorns. It was determined that BMPs had been met or exceeded 98% of the time across all ownerships. The 2023 Forest Landowner of the Year is Mark and Nancy Nichols from Foxboro, Wyoming. The Nichols purchased their 25-acre property in 1999 and immediately created a def defensible space around the cabin they built. In 2018, they received a forest stewardship plan from State Forestry and completed timber stand improvement work. The 2020 Mullen Fire burned through the Nicholas's entire property, but because of the active management completed, their cabin, structures, and most of their forested lands were saved. The Nicholas story exemplifies the importance of active management and collaboration partnerships formed between Wyoming State Forestry and Wyoming's private forested landowners. Lastly, over this past year, State Forestry has been able to take in a diverse amount of federal grants, like GNA, but also IIJA and RA bill funding. Since 2022, we have doubled the number of agreements and federal funding we now manage. For example, we've been very successful in our competitive fuels mitigation grants, which brought in 2.9 million, as well as our urban and community forestry IRA grant, which we accepted for 500,000. Funding being, the funding that we are receiving is being directed to on the ground projects that will positively impact Wyoming's forest, communities, landowners, and citizens. And with that, I'll con con conclude my report here and stand for any questions or can pass it on off. Thank you. Legislators, do you have any questions of the state for us? I have a huge thank you. You know, Kelly stepped in and I've, I've made this comment before is uh, we, we'd hired you a long time ago. If we'd known that Bill retired, we'd have years without spending millions of dollars fighting fire. And uh, I, I, I want to thank you. I think Wyoming the State Forestry has done a phenomenal job of both timber management and fire suppression. And, uh, back to all the folks you're sitting with is I, th I think Wyoming's a model for forest management and I, I, I would hope all of you take a, a close look because the private forests are managed much different than the public forests and not knocking public ownership but the tools they're given and the ability they're given often the forests are much healthier and in better conditions and 
I hope we all look at that as we look at forest plans. So thank you. Any other questions of the state forester for now? Is that an answer or a question? <laughs> yeah, that's not a question, but that that'll work. So no, let's just keep keep rolling, and then if we get some questions, we'll come back to it. Very good. Um, so uh, again, good afternoon, Senate President Driscoll, um, Speaker Summers, and members of the committee. As I mentioned, Frank Bim, a regional forester, of Rocky Mountain region, which includes part of Wyoming, uh, except for the western. Um, portion of the Wyoming, as well as Colorado, South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas. And in Wyoming, in Rocky Mountain region, it includes the Bighorn, the Shoshone, the Medicine Bow, and the Black Hills National Forest, as well as the Thunder Basin National Grassland. I introduced a few folks. I missed a couple, so I'm going to name them real quick. Phil Osterley is in the back. You can raise your hand. Phil is our Wyoming liaison. And Milton Stubbs is Deputy Forest Supervisor on the Medicine Bow Route and Thunder Basin National Grasslands. So thank you for the opportunity to come before the Agriculture, State, Public Lands, and Water Resources Committee. Wyoming holds a special place for me as I've lived and worked on the Shoshone National Forest out of Dubois and uh, the Medicine Bow out of Laramie, and both my sons were born in Wyoming. I look forward to continuing conversations and our great work together. I would like to thank Kelly, Wyoming Ag Department Director Doug Miyamoto, as well as Director of State Game and Fish Department Brian Nesvik, Wyoming State Parks Director Dave Glenn, and um, Darren Westby at the Department of Transportation and their respective staffs for our continuing partnerships. Together with these and many other conservation organizations and industry partners, as was mentioned, including the timber industry and livestock producers, we're doing significant work in Wyoming to sustain our nation's forest and grasslands for present and future generations. As we all know, there's much more to do. So what have we done? The Rocky Mountain region is focused on restoring healthy, resilient landscapes to reduce wildfire risk, to protect communities and lives, improve forest and grassland conditions, and deliver values, products, and services to the public. Together, we had many accomplishments and successes together with our partners. We invested more than $326,000 of bipartisan infrastructure law and Inflation Reduction Act funding in Wyoming, in addition to our regular program um, funding for hazardous fuels reduction. We accomplished a total of 26,000 acres of mechanical treatment, and approximately 5,500 acres in total prescribed burning on national forests in Wyoming. This fiscal year, we've already accomplished nearly 4,000 acres of prescribed burning and nearly 400 acres of mechanical treatment. We're using all the tools and authorities uh, to accomplish this work. The goal of the wildfire crisis strategy is to reduce wildfire risk in high-risk landscapes and fire sheds where wildfire is likely to pose the greatest threats to communities. Of the 250 high-risk fire sheds designated on National Forest System lands in western United States, one is wholly in Wyoming, the Dunor Fire Shed on the Shoshone National Forest. And we're working with partners there to implement projects and develop them for wildfire risk reduction that will directly benefit Dubois, Wyoming, and expanding our relationships through agreements to get this work done. We also, you know, we have uh, many pots of money that we're trying to put to work in Wyoming and others. And so uh, we've invested three and a half million dollars in bipartisan infrastructure law funding in 13 potential operation delineation projects on the Medicine Bow and National Forest and Thunder Basin National Grasslands. So potential operation delineation or pods, as we call them, are planning units that are defined by boundaries such as roads or natural features that can be used as control lines in wildfire. These investments will accelerate our fuels reduction projects through an all hands, all lands approach using tools such as good neighbor authority that Kelly mentioned, stewardship authority, and various other shared stewardship tools aimed at enhancing and resilient landscapes. These fuel breaks are critical to improve the safety of community, firefighters, and infrastructure. Touch on watersheds for a moment uh, before I get into vegetation treatment. In addition, we're reducing, to reducing the risk of wildfire to municipal watersheds and associated infrastructure has been a high priority in the region for many years. Our focus remains on mitigating potential wildfires through hazardous fuel treatments, proactive forest management, and early engagement with our partners. We're using Inflation Reduction Act funding to support watershed projects on these lands. In addition to our normal reforestation activities, we also will be protecting watersheds under the repairing existing public land by adding necessary trees or replant act as part of the bipartisan infrastructure law the replant act removed a cap on forest service funding for reforestation allowing us to now access nearly 10 times more uh, 
money in reforestation investments annually. In Wyoming, we've identified the need to replant 80,000 80, acres over time in large fire scars and other landscapes. Touching on timber management, as you know, timber management remains a key tool in our work to create and maintain resilient landscapes while providing important economic support to local economies throughout Wyoming. In fiscal year 2023, the region sold approximately 186 million board feet. On the Bighorn, Shoshone, and Medicine Bow route, approximately 35 million board feet were sold. The Black Hills National Forest Program remains a national priority and sold nearly 49.3 million board feet last year. This includes fuels reduction projects outside of the suitable base, within spruce stands, and on steep slopes. As part of our effort to keep mills supplied with timber in Wyoming and South Dakota, we successfully implemented the Timber Transit Pilot together with the National Wild Turkey Federation and moved more than, th more than 3 million board feet of timber by rail from California to Upton, Wyoming. This wood was then delivered to Hewlett and Spearfish Mills as needed. And this was mentioned by Kelly in terms of the monitoring of, uh, of um, bugs. I'll also just briefly mention the LIDAR work we're doing on the Black Hills. We've completed 1,650 plots in partnership with Wyoming and South Dakota Forestry through GNA and completed our LIDAR flights. Assessments will be complete this spring and into early summer, which will give us a better view of uh, what, we're, what we have on the ground on the Black Hills in cooperation with uh, FIA data. So I'm going to give you an update on forest plan re revision, but before I do that, I want to mention the recent announcement by the Department of Agriculture publication of a notice of intent to prepare an environmental impact statement. This project proposes to amend all 128 forest land management plans to conserve and steward old growth forest conditions. This amendment is intended to create a consistent approach for how we manage old growth forest conditions. The initial comment period was closed on February 2nd. This is an agency, and we received a lot of comments, as we expected. This is an agency-wide national effort, and internally, we're still learning more about the analysis and timelines. Ultimately, as we go through the process, we'll know more about the effects of, this, of these amendments on managing our national forests. So turning to forest plan revisions, we are making progress in our efforts to ch uh, address change conditions on the Black Hills and determine appropriate long-term annual harvest levels through the forest plan revision process. Assessments are being finalized and were released last November, and the planning process has transitioned to being led and staffed primarily by the Mountain Planning Service Group. This group was centralized, um, is a centralized Forest Service planning organization recently established to provide forest plan revision support in four regions, Rocky Mountain, Intermountain, Northern, and Southwest region. And we plan to publish a notice of intent to formally kick off the Black Hills Plan Revision later this year. Our cooperating agencies and our Black Hills National Forest Advisory Board meetings have been and will continue to be essential in this process. Earlier in the year, the Medicine Bow Route National Forest began initial con conversations with the Mountain Planning Service Group as they were slated to start pre-assessment revision this year. Given the emphasis and priority work towards revision efforts on the Black Hills and the Bridger Teton, which are well underway, we anticipate work on the Medicine Bow will start in fiscal year 24. So it's going to be bumped a year. Touch on state grants. Uh, in 2023, we provided funding to the Wyoming Urban and Community Forest that aided 369,000 Wyoming community members, uh, including $40,000 in state grants to six communities. In fiscal 23, we also, Wyoming also received significant funding for implementation of the Forest Action Plan with match requirements waived. In cooperative fire uh, state grants, Wyoming received approximately $428,000 in funding and $1.2 million in state fire capacity, state fire assistance, and volunteer fire capacity programs. They also received $190,000 in base funding for community wildfire defense grants. Just touch on a couple more things before I close. Good Neighbor Authority, uh, other congressional funding source are paying dividends here in Wyoming. Three GNA master agreements with Wyoming State Forestry Division, Game and Fish, and the Department of Agriculture. As part of these agreements, we have 23 active supplemental project agreements with uh, seven state and county partners, including Sheridan, Johnson, Laramie, Bighorn, Albany, and Carbon counties, with more than $12 million in total funding to support these agreements. Invasives, just to touch on that, invasive species management continues to be a focus together with partners. 
We have been battling invasive plants such as cheatgrass in the mullein fire footprint, conducting aerial spraying operations on new invasive grasses on the bighorn, and creating a better inventory of grasses for joint aerial spraying in Wyoming and South Dakota. The region received $600, $630,000 in other funds to combat uh, invasives. Regarding recreation, we're actively implementing the Great American Outdoors Act through 64 projects uh, in Wyoming, totaling $18.5 million. In closing, I want to provide a brief personnel update to many of you, including Senator Driscoll, who have worked with, with Deputy Regional Forester Jackie Buchanan for a number of years. Uh, for almost 11 years, she served in this region. She was recently promoted to Regional Forester in the Pacific, South, Pacific Northwest region out of Portland, Oregon. We'll certainly miss Jackie, but wish her the best in her new role. Deputy Regional Forester Steve Lohr will move into Jackie's Renewable Resources po Portfolio, which he's very familiar with, having recently served as her director. So I look forward to great opportunities to further our partnerships, and I, that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to take questions. Sure, I, I guess I'll start. <clears throat> One is, you know, this is, this is, I'm a cowboy, I'm not a forester, and I'm, I'm not in your agency, but this whole push behind this old growth mm -hmm. In, in all of the uh, in all of these forests, did we learn nothing from what happened in the Northwest and the impacts that pushing old growth in the Northwest had, and ultimately the fire catastrophes that happened that happens and continues to happen? So that's a question. And then my other question revolves around, you know, it's nice that that these you know, federal pots of money are actually putting some money into the Forest Service. Mm -hmm. But one of your biggest challenges that I see locally is you can't recruit people because you can't pay them enough to live in these places where there's forests. If you don't have people recruited and you don't have people on staff, you can't get projects out the door or the projects are like my uh, upper green grazing deal mm -hmm. that was 20 some years in the cooking mm -hmm. on an EIS. And so it's critically important. I don't know how we help you or how we help be your voice, but you've got to have personnel. It's not about the $5 million or $10 million you get out of a bucket of federal money that you can't put on the ground because you can't pay people to put it on the ground. And so how are you going to address that issue? How is the Forest Service going to address the issue of not having staff? And I mean, this forest collaborative thing is great, mm -hmm. and it's the state's attempt to try to bolster that system, but it's so many levels that you're short of people on so many positions that I'm, I'm really concerned you're gonna become even worse. I mean, you're almost at a stalemate now, and I'm, I'm really worried that you just don't have the ability to get work done. Um, thank you, uh, Representative Summers. So on um, your first question on the, the uh, old growth piece, Again, we're we're just in the early stages of that, and and uh, we'll know more as we move forward move forward with that uh, process to understand how it's going to impact our forests. We do know that all of our forest forest plans have addressed um, old growth in one way or another, and this is an attempt to to standardize that um, language in the forest plans to be more consistent. On the housing piece, I couldn't agree more, and we're very much. Um, concerned with our ability to recruit and not only recruit uh, and hire, but also retain our workforce. And so on the housing front, I will say that we did have a success this past year in the Rocky Mountain region in Colorado. Um, we used the authority within the 2018 Farm Bill to um, initiate a project with the county to um, lease our land that uh, was in a uh, a work area uh, to the county and they we're going to build uh, units on that property for 162 I think units the Forest Service will get about 30 of those units for our seasonal seasonals and we're, we look we, we know we've got a problem for housing across the agency we're doing everything we can to try and address that that's one success we're also looking at the ability to um, increase our um, our pay in certain areas where we, we know for example Denver, where I'm at, Lakewood, we get a, a higher cost of living than in areas like Jackson that are extremely uh, expensive to live. So we're looking at ways to address that as well. We know it's a problem. We need to recruit folks and, and be able to uh, have them have a livable wage in our... So is there a national strategy on this? Is there anything besides just, I mean, 
bless Colorado's heart for Summit yeah. County for giving you some so, land. It was Summit County that could afford it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're working with um, with Congress on I say we the department on uh, the new farm bill, trying to get that uh, uh, authority. Uh, passed again, so we can do that kind of work across the across the agency. But yes, we, the chief has, has stood up a national team that's looking at housing. Um, we each region is focused on different uh, ways to address this issue as well. Um, we're also looking at ways to uh, for those that are in seasonal housing where they pay quarters. Our quarters rates have just gone up to a not a sustainable rate. So we're looking at ways that we can. Um, reduce the impact to our seasonals, seasonals and permanent workforce that are in seasonal or in uh, forest service housing uh, try and reduce that impact as well. And, and the money, you know, and I'll quit here and let these guys go at it, but no, no worries. the infrastructure on the ground, mm -hmm. we have lands that should be accessed by the public, but we don't have the ability to do erosion control on roads. You all don't and to fix roads and to make things trails that are appropriate to allow public access and to the point that eventually they become, you get stream degradation and all, all kinds of things. And so, you know, I, I, I really wonder how long-term, it's not just housing, there's a sustainability issue with the Forest Service, both in their ability to put stuff on the ground and their ability to house people and their ability mm -hmm. to pay a wage to actually have a good person. And so, you know, I just, if there's one thing I could take back, you know, I hope you would take back from my mm -hmm. discussion is, man, you you know, I'm worried you're, the wheels are gonna fall off. Yeah, uh, huh. yeah I don't disagree. Uh, this year's budget, well, we don't have a budget. You know, we're still operating on a continuing resolution. We'll see if we get a full year budget or not. We're also operating under, because of the, the uh, debt ceiling deal, we're looking at F our funding this year at the FY22 level, so that's a challenge. And we're trying to figure out how we're, we're managing that, as well as the good thing, which we received a 5.2% pay increase this year, but we don't have the funds to pay that. So anyhow, we're trying to figure all that out as we move forward, because we have a challenge both on our salary and expense side of our funding, as well as the uh, program side of our funding and and uh it's i'm not gonna yeah it's gonna be a challenge this year to sort all that out president driscoll you got anything i'll let senator hicks know senator about. hicks i see he's got a half page full mm -hmm. mr chairman i'm just gonna wait basically the same set of questions to answer um okay, capturing okay. some of it so go ahead several and i guess I, I think you saw some frustration expressed by my co-chairman here, and you're going to see that from me and maybe a bit amplified is um, I think you're pretty aware, you know, I, I live up in the Northeast and the Black Hills and mm -hmm. my family grew up in the Black Hills National Forest. We were the first forest permitted in the United States, and it was also the first timber sale. As you folks look at your maps, you'll find it's probably the greenest national forest in the United States. It's not dead, it's still alive. We've logged it longer than any other national forest. And I'm sitting here now, I put money in the budget, watching a forest plan go through and watching a community that I saw, grew up with sawmills, that old family pictures show half of what we now consider the Black Hills National Forest were grasslands and didn't have timber on them. That's now part of your old growth forest. It's now part of your old growth forest. And as we talk about cutting timber, all of a sudden, these acres that were never timbered acres are now considered part of the sacred deal we have in a town that I live in that's supported, I'd guess, 80% by a sawmill. Probably will not have a sawmill in the next five years unless the Forest Service actually deviates from their management plan. And my end's been just unbelievable frustration on this is, you know, we help pay for the LIDAR and that's going to be one of my first questions is how much did you folks help pay for it and how did it come about as I was on call the other day and I now find out that a good part of what we're using the LIDAR for is to find cultural sites mm -hmm. that are going to stop our timber industry and stop grazing. You guys are actively, or at least you can tell me if it's not right, but mm -hmm. actively using it to look for cultural sites. 
really concerning to me. We're using state money for that. And back to the management, Speaker Summers talked about it. State of Wyoming's invested $10 million in pine tree programs in conjunction with South Dakota. And I don't know what they spent. At one point in time, I stood up on the Senate floor and held a map up that you could see from a satellite photo, one side brown and dead, one side green. It's a result of a, a pretty low end management program that you folks actually, the way you participated in it was to help us with some NEPA and kind of let us do it. But I think you've seen how we can manage better. But what I actually see is traveling the state of Wyoming, at one point in time, we showed a drastic reduction in pine beetle activity. Not because we whipped them, because so much of our forest was dead that we didn't show pine beetles. And now I see that management practice coming to the forest I live in. And that terrifies me. We've actually got one program that worked, one program that worked nationally that I know about, at least in Wyoming. And what you guys are saying is, let's move and manage like we did elsewhere. And, you know, we talk about climate change and your administration's very big into climate change. Have you adapted any of your management practices to accommodate climate change? Because I'm going to tell you from my end, and I've got a pretty large timber operation on my own place, pretty large timber base. I would way rather overcut timber. We all know it's a renewable resource and regos. I'd way rather overcut my ranch, which I did, by the way, against, I'm looking at part of Diamond Sky. They fought with me. 25 years ago, I moved to 80 foot spacing on my trees when standard was 15. And they said, why would you do that? And I said, well, I like grazing, but we found out afterwards the timber grows quite a little bit better and the, and the fire danger is different. I'm gonna make a prediction to you, and I pray I don't have to look someone in the eye as an old man. Should you manage the Black Hills the way you're attempting to and what we're seeing coming down through plans? My forest is gonna look like the rest of Wyoming. It's either gonna be burnt off in black or we're gonna have pine needles. And it, it bothers me. And I, I like I said, I, I know I'm sounding harsh, but you get pretty harsh when you have to get up and look at it every day. I live at Devil's Tower and you know, I've watched management make what I look out my window at an absolutely beautiful stand of timber to a burnt off hillside. And I implore of you as, as you folks go into these, that you don't think so much about protection, but you think about longevity and resiliency. And, and I know they talk about it, but I don't see it in what's coming. I've, wa I've watched the sales in our area and I, mm -hmm. I realize maybe we've overcut, we've had some forest, it's possible, I don't know. But if we're gonna make a mistake, Let's make the mistake that we have to wait 25 or 50 years for that next old growth forest, because we can create one almost anywhere. You, you can't create them in Cheyenne very well. I can assure you I can take any hay meadow on my ranch and in a 75 year period, turn it into an old growth forest. That's what, that's what pine trees do. They, they take over good fertile ground and they become big trees. And it's really, really, like I said, you saw his frustration, mine's unbelievable because I don't want my grandkids to grow up in a forest that wasn't a forest. And I can tell you, 1897, you go back to the Organic Act, mm -hmm. you look at when you guys were formed, mm -hmm. you actually read what, what, your, what your directive is. Mm -hmm. It's not about recreation. It's about providing a timber supply for this country. We're not providing anywhere near the timber supply that, that we did. And we'll provide even less. And we'll provide more carbon dioxide and more decaying carbon if we don't keep our forest green. So I know I preach this is the only time I ever get a platform with you folks. I, I don't go to DC enough. But for those of us that you get 35,000, 135,000 comments from someone from Virginia, Colorado, Idaho, wherever. And you know, they've never been in my forest. They've looked at a picture. They've heard these evil things about these guys with chainsaws or timber beasts that are destroying the world. And in truth, it's a renewable supply. We can create it and recreate it and recreate it. But it's damn hard to fix it after it's been burnt really bad or it's been mismanaged. So 
for me as we go into it, it's just major frustration. Because and, and my last piece is when you go to the old growth. It takes us decades to try to do a forest plan, literally decades mm -hmm. setting it up. And this old forest plan, boom, comes out of thin air and, and hits me alongside the head. And I don't know if it's been decades in planning, I certainly haven't seen it. It appeared to me it showed up in a, in a period of about 18 months and all of a sudden it's teed up and ready to go. But I don't think the forest plans are going to be that quick. And I don't see the, the same in-depth comment period in that end of it. It, it kind of, I'll tell you, you didn't get one of mine because I didn't even catch it good on my radar until my, my local guys went into a tailspin over it. I sure knew about the forest plan. I put put a million bucks in our budget two years ahead because I think it's unbelievably important for guys like me. I've been here more than a decade. Black Hills National Forest is my number one issue. And I, I implore you to figure out a way that your guys look at it, mm -hmm. that you don't protect us to the point that you kill us. Thank you. It's, it's the end of the day and we get passionate. <laughs> I, I really don't it's okay. Yeah, and, and uh, you know. Yeah, well, I, I can too. I can talk to, I can speak to LIDAR if, if you. Sure, go ahead. Sure, and thank you, Senator, um, and, and appreciate the, the additional funding. We So you asked how much did we spend on the LIDAR, 1.4 million for the, the flights and, and um the field plots, and, and I think we're about 500,000 in for the assessment work that we're going into. And that's your money, not money from South Dakota and Wyoming? That's correct. Yes, All sir. right, and so I'm good with the other end of use of it then. You know, mine was, I was on a call and didn't understand it all probably, and yeah. I'm gonna tell you for my end is, if stuff's getting used for stuff wasn't intended for and my state pays for it, I'm unhappy. And sure. so my apologies on no, that. No worries. Yeah. I'm great with what you pay for. You yeah. you need to, to get what you want. But sure. the stuff I pay for, I'm pretty famous to say, and is uh, if I'm paying for it and signing the check, I'm going to ask for what, what I want. So yes, sir. Thank you. Well, let's just keep going down the line. Thank you. All right. Well, Senate President uh, Driscoll, and Speaker Summers, members of the committee, um, good evening. Um, again, I'm Chris Campbell. I'm the Deputy Regional Forester from the Intermountain Region, and our region covers the western portion of Wyoming, southern Idaho, Nevada, and Utah. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you um, here this evening, and, and thank you, um, State Forester Norris, for, for inviting me and my colleagues to, uh, to be here this evening. Um, as you may know, the Intermountain Region encompasses four national forests um, in western Wyoming, so predominantly the Bridger Teton, but also the Ashley, Caribou Targhee, and Uinta Wasatch Cache National Forests, um, covering about 3.8 million acres of land. As stewards of these lands, we are committed to the Forest Service mission of managing national forests for multiple uses for the benefit of current and future generations. This includes forest health, water, and wildlife management protecting cultural and heritage resources and sites, livestock grazing, mineral extraction, outdoor recreation, and timber production. Uh, currently, the Intermountain Region administers 418 grazing permits, um, oversees four ski area permits, and 235 outfitter and guide operations in the state of Wyoming. The estimated annual visitation to Western Wyoming forests is over 2.2 million per year. The vast majority of those visits um, occurring on the Bridger Teton National Forest and the Ashley National Forest Flaming Gorge Ranger District. Um, you heard earlier uh, State Forester Norris mentioned our work around shared, shared stewardship. And um, that's something that we have really been leaning into over the last few years. And I think I'm happy to say over the last few months, we've really reinvigorated our conversations around um, doing the right work um, in the right place um, together. Um, it's looking at cross-boundary opportunities to focus our treatments, uh, to protect against insect and disease and reduce our wildfire risk. And you know, not worrying about our jurisdictional boundaries, but working together, um, looking at our priorities and our shared landscapes and bringing you know, the scale of the solution to the, the scale of the problem that's in front of us. Um, State Forester Norris also mentioned you know, the fire season that we had this last year, uh, which I guess I'm happy to report 
that it was 10% um, of the previous six year average, so a very low fire year. Um, and there were no large fires in the Western Wyoming forests. While 2023 was a below average fire year, we still recognize that multiple years of drought, overgrown forest, past fire suppression policies and continued development expansion of our wildland urban interface all contribute to growing wildfire threats to public health and community safety. Uh, we, com we remain committed to address these threats alongside our state and other partners. Um, on the timber and fuels front, um, some recent success that we've seen with partners include work that have been done with the Lincoln and Sublette County collaborative groups and cooperatives. As we discussed last year, this work is funded by you and the governor's task force to identify future vegetation management opportunities in those counties. This year, the Forest Service is committing $100,000 to those collaboratives to support implementation of the Bridger Tetons 10 year vegetation plan. I'm also pleased to report that we continue to increase the pace and scale of active forest management through the Good Neighbor Authority. Our FY23 accomplishments resulted in 125% of our regional target sold, with some 12.2 million board feet sold via the Wyoming Good Neighbor Authority timber sales. This includes three timber sales on the Bridger Teton at approximately 1.1 million board feet and a much larger 11.1 11 .1 million board foot a timber sale on the Evanston Ranger District from our Uena Wasatch Cache National Forest. In turn, the state forestry GNA timber sales have fueled local mills such as the South and Jones Timber Company in Southwest Wyoming. In addition to creating Wyoming jobs, Good Neighbor Authority initiatives have led to reforestation of over 9,800 acre, acres region wide. We are working across state lines with our timber sales in Utah on the UNO Wasatch Cache National Forest, where we've produced significant volume that is being processed by South and Jones Mills in Evanston and Mountain View, Wyoming. Seven sales occurred in 2021, and there are 15 additional timber sales planned through 2026 as part of the forest five-year vegetation plan. In addition to timber, fuels, and fire management, I'd like to highlight some of the other important work we're doing in Wyoming, specifically in our recreation programs. Between FY21 and 23, the Intermountain region has invested about 5.1 million in Great American Outdoors Act funding across our forests in Wyoming. This investment is being used to improve campgrounds, our roads, water and wastewater systems, parking lots, trails, signs, and bridges. Over a million dollars in work has already been completed. Another 3 million is underway in progress, and about 1.1 million is currently awaiting the start of construction. Um, Speaker Summers, you mentioned access, and that is a really big um, priority for us, and it is a, a challenge. Um, it's a priority for us in the region and also the agency. There are several notable actions that we're taking um, currently underway. Um, a few major projects are the Cottonwood Creek Trail Project on the Bridger Teton National Forest, where we have about $440,000 in legacy roads and trails funding that is currently um, being put to use. And on the Caribou Targi National Forest, we received 2.6 million in federal lands transportation and bipartisan infrastructure law funding to repair the Teton County Road. In 2023, our state, private, and tribal forestry investments in Wyoming include coast stewardship at the Medicine Wheel National Historic Landmark in collaboration with the Nor Northern Cheyenne Tribe. The Munger Mountain Forest Legacy Project was completed last November, and celebrations will occur um, when the snow melts in the spring on that project. Other state and private forestry grants included a contract award to start a biomass utilization study, some 750,000 in urban and community forestry grants to the state of Wyoming, 700,000 to the city of Casper, and 100,000 to the city of Rock Springs. With respect to forest planning progress that many of you are interested in, the Ashley National Forest signed their forest plan of record, or signed their forest plan record of decision just a few weeks ago on January 25th. This new plan replaces the 1986 plan and is the first new forest plan in our region, the Intermountain region, in over 20 years. The forest is also currently in the process of updating its management plan for the Flaming Gorge National Recreation Area, which will cover the planned Buckboard Marina expansion and look to improve both recreational opportunities and assist Wyoming merchants along the gorge. The Bridger Teton National Forest is also very close to formally launching their forest plan revision effort with the notice of intent expected this spring. Over the past few months, the Forest has been leaning into their preparations for the official kickoff of their planning effort with a statewide planning symposium and an intertribal gathering 
with the Eastern Shoshone, the Northern Arapaho, as well as neighboring tribal nations such as the Blackfeet, Crow, Nez Perce, and Shoshone Bannock, among others. This forest plan is a priority for our region, and this update is long overdue. Um, so just in closing, I want to thank you again for the opportunity to talk with you today. Uh, this concludes my prepared remarks, and I welcome any questions. Thank you. And, <clears throat> you know, uh, I still have the boxes from the last Bridger Teton forest plan that I have dog-eared. Um, my worry now is that it's going to be 10 boxes, if you could print it at all. And I, I really do want some, you know, and just a little bit, just a little bit of history since we're going back. So, you know, I'm, I'm not the first, but my family's, my family's been in the Upper Green before there was a Forest Service. And, uh, and really the Forest Service came in there. Uh, one man, Zeph Jones, came in and, uh, and it was to regulate the tie hacks. That was really the, when the Forest Service first made the presence into my country because there were tie hacks and they needed to, your mission was to regulate forests and, and that's what you did. One man did all of that. And, uh, and we went, you know, in the, the, the problem we have with, with a lot of uses, right, is it's all or nothing. And in the 70s, I would have said, and many of us did, that you cut too much timber in the Bridger Teton. You cut timber on slopes and in soils, you should never have cut timber. And having said that, and said that at the time, when we've had this, the beetle hit, you know the only thing that was left green were those stands of timber that had been cut in the 70s, and they were of size at this time, right? These, these are not new trees. These were pretty good-sized trees for our country, but they were strong enough to withstand the deal. Now, we had a lot of sedimentation and streams, and that's worked its way through. And I mean, just as you think about things, just try to remember, never go to the extreme. Whether that extreme is conservation, whether that extreme is use, there's, there's a, a middle place there that's probably best for everybody and is sustainable. And it's really about sustainable uses. But on the, on the Bridger Teton forest plan, what I would really like, and maybe it's the good, maybe, maybe I just, when I get out of session, maybe I need to go up to Jackson and sit down with the, the gentleman. But I really want to know what you're going to do, how you're going to engage grazers in a meaningful way, Right now, you're, you're in that phase of determining what the existing condition is. How do we influence that? How do we say, well, no, that's BS. I don't, I don't agree with what you wrote there. Buy some LIDAR. And, uh, <laughs> well, I heard the price tag. I can't afford the LIDAR. So, you know, I'm wondering how we have meaning, meaningful participation in this process and how, because how you determine the existing condition is incredibly important to how you will, what kind of prescriptions you'll put in place. So just walk me through what you're gonna do on the Bridger Teton, how you're gonna involve grazers, recreators, wildlife enthusiasts, all of us, how's that gonna happen? So I don't have a, a timeline set out in front of me, but I know that the Chad Hudson, the forest supervisor on the Bridger Teton um, has been, it's been a particular focus uh, for a number of months now, um, trying to engage all the different stakeholders and partners um, around this work. Um, I would welcome and I'd be happy to, to set up um, a meeting um, with you, um, Speaker Summers and anyone else uh, at the legislature to, to lay out kind of what, what the plan is and the timeline and along with the State Forester, um, so that you have a clear idea of what, what the timelines are that, that we're working with right now. Um, it, it, like I mentioned, it is a priority for us um, to, to make this happen. Um, and it's a huge undertaking. And um, you know, with some of the work around old growth and mature, it, it's not gonna make it any easier, at least over the next few months. And so I think um, that's something I can commit to that, that we'd be happy to share with you what that plan is. And if we're missing anything, we'd, we'd be happy to I'll see what we can do to include that. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. So anybody got any questions of the <laughs> Intermountain? <laughs> Chairman Eccles. Mr. Speaker, I'd, so, four pages. I know. I, 
I'll be somewhat brief. In my mind, the, the Ag Committee's discussed foresting and, and what have you, and most of my members are, are too young to remember that in 1970, logging was the third greatest industry in Wyoming. And, but I can still remember that. My grandfather was a tie hack up not too far from where Albert was speaking of, North Cottonwood. Um, I live out on the plains and you'd think it doesn't affect us, but it affects the entire state of Wyoming to take that kind of an industry down to nothing. So mid nineties, I think it was the last, was that the last sawmill? Larry would know about the last sawmill. All the leasing ended then and we put all our, our uh, sawmills out of business and we had no way of managing the beetle epidemic that has just destroyed the, the whole forest in here. As far as recreation goes, you try to get off of the main roads and you can't walk through it. It's, it's tough, you can't. Places I used to fish as a kid, I used to fish alongside of cattle and, uh, and now the cattle can't get back there. And I have trouble, I'm old enough, I have trouble getting back to those spots to even, even fish. Um, and I, my thoughts are that without consistent policy, that's what we don't have. Um, it's a hopeless deal. We can't, there have, has to be a steady leasing policy and a steady policy from the federal government. Um, I know there's a lot of disagreement, but without that, we all lose. We just end up with sick brown force. Um, either way, you don't have, next administration comes through and says, yeah, we'll lease it. Well, there's no, there's no sawmills left. So that's what we've, we've kind of been facing. Um, and I, you know, I don't know how to fix it right now, but I, I do know that uh, getting us back to even where logging is on the radar in our economy. Um, well, like Senator Dr President Driscoll talked really the only viable sawmill in the state is up in his neck of the woods and it's managed privately and, and still it's uh, an, in jeopardy because of, of inconsistent policies. So those are my thoughts. Go ahead, Senator Hicks. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, gentlemen, I listened to, you know, the presentation and I appreciate the fact that you're here, but I've, I've got a number of questions and they may be a little bit circular, but they'll be directed to both of you and much of it's an information request. But so it gets to this first issue of the 128 forest where we're going to do one environmental impact statement. And as you guys will know, there's no one slice fits all. So let's start out with that premise. What I'd like to know is how many acres are there in each forest within Wyoming in R2 and R4? How many are already in designated wilderness? May, and you may know some of these numbers. Um, one of the things that would be very helpful under your existing inventory is, is how many acres by species are older or outside the historic range of variation by management area. Since how we're going to go down this road anyway, I might as well get you guys started gathering data because that really becomes the crux of the issue. And so how, so th th those are information requests. How many acres? How many, are, how many do we have in wilderness area? What I really am interested in by species that are older and outside the HRV, historic range of variation, because that's the stuff that will be eligible for potential old growth classification under this proposed EIS. Um, so if, if we could get that information, it'd be very helpful. Back to the acres question. You know, acres of treatments, do a lot of treatments, work with the Forest Service on a number of these over the years, but you know, guys, I think we all know what we're prescribing as one acre solutions to million acre problems. That's what my three colleagues up here are really concerned about is the millions and million acre problem that we have. And the, so it helps me versus not saying that we did 9,000 acres or 26,000 acres in the whole forest. What's that percentage of the forest? 
and we'll set a percentage of those eligible acres under those management area prescriptions and so what's what's available. Uh, that's a pretty key component as far as we move forward. So when we do this, one of the questions that I have is in the analysis that you guys will ultimately end up being able to conduct within the, the, this EIS associated with this is, will the publication that was produced by the USDA Department of Agriculture, US Forest Service on the condition of our National Forest Association with where we're at as far as carbon emissions. Right now, according to your, your own publications, about 6% of all carbon emitted in the United States is, is, is absorbed by national forests. By 2035, that reverses. Some already are net carbon emitters. And by 27, our national forests are gonna be net carbon emitters. So it exacerbates the problem of bark beetles and fires how is this going to be looked at in context of this accumulation of carbon? And the carbon that's emitted is because of decomposing, dying forest. I think what these guys are talking about, we need to manage these forests. But this has absolutely got to be front and center of part of the analysis associated with this. Because I think you guys, there's, an, there's a preponderance of scientific evidence out here that we look at. Even in some of the big years, I go back to 2020, all the fires in California admitted more carbon in one year than all the power plants. So your big carbon problem that you guys have that's building up there. So I fully expect, or I would, I'd, I'd like to ask each one of you guys, how, you, how do you intend to address that in the issue with the Environmental Impact Association with protection of old growth relative to carbon, fire, fuels, historic range of variation? So. Anybody want to weigh in on that one to start with, and then we'll go from there. Go ahead. I can weigh in. Um, I don't have the answers, but we're happy to um, look into those. The by species outside a range of natural variability, I uh, don't know if we can get that, but we can certainly uh, look into that. I understand the question. Be good to, yeah, I made a few notes, um, but I'd sure like to get your questions, and, and we can feed this to the team that's doing the analysis. You know, we um, we've got a portion of that group I, I described earlier, the Mountain Planning Service Group. They have about 17 or 18 folks on that team. They're going to be dedicated within our region as well as the other three, Intermountain Region and Northern Region and Southwest Region, to do this work and analysis. So um, we can certainly take this information back. I would encourage you, if you haven't, to submit, even though the comment period's closed, comment period kind of never really closed, those comments can still be um, submitted in terms of questions, um, and we can take those back as well and make sure that they're considered as they go through the analysis. Well, your colleague, is it, is it Chris? It's Chris. Yeah, Chris. Yes, sir. I don't um, want to give you an opportunity to duck a question. Yeah, no, it, it's a great question. And, um, you know, climate change is something that is factored into the, the forest planning and our NEPA processes. Um, one thing that's unclear to me, or it, it, I think where I would be starting to speculate would be around how does wildfire factor into that? Um, because I think those are typically seen as more of an act of God and not something that we're um, actively managing, you know, um, outside of a prescribed fire. And so um, I think there are good questions that you're asking. Um, and I think we're, we're all looking forward to uh, maybe getting to some of the answers um, to those questions that, that you brought up. So let's take off from there as we get into this and this thing rolls out and you guys have to roll it out on the ground. I'm assuming there'll be some level of each forest or each region participation in this. So what's your intention as far as cooperating agency status with states, local governments, and at what level of cooperation? Are we looking at down to the ID team level of participation or are we just, what, what level within that whole process do you anticipate? from each of your positions, from R2 and R4, when those requests come for local government, state government, and what level of participation do you see that those entities are gonna be able to, to participate within the development of these plans? Or is it because it's not up to Washington DC level, there's no cooperating agency? There we go. So great questions. We, we haven't really, we've got um, 
a lot of requests for how to how to um, for states and counties to in, and join with us in cooperative agency status. I don't, to be honest with you, I haven't really considered exactly how that would work in terms of the ID teams. I think that makes a lot of sense to have somebody in the state on an ID team. I, I'm not committing to that, but I'm committing to the idea of that, taking that back. Counties, um, I know that at the national level, they're working with the National Association of Counties, NACO, to determine a process for counties to be able to um, have an umbrella, I think, or, or under under NACO to be cooperating agency. I'm not sure how that's working right now. I know that's just come up recently. I know Wyoming County Commissioner Association were in last week meeting with some of our leaders in Washington office and that, that was shared at that meeting. So uh, I believe the original uh, Federal Register notice did not include counties as potential cooperating agency. That's been brought up on a number of, number of uh, comments and the agency is looking to figure out how to make that happen under NACO umbrella. So, again, I would ask your colleague, if you, Chris, if you want to weigh in on that, do you see it being different in Region 2 and Region 4? Um, Senator, I, it's a national process, um, and so I would foresee limited very, like difference between the two regions. Um, I think we would have a similar stance of um, trying to, to maximize on that engagement where we can, um, but this is a, a national process that's, that's being driven, and so there's there's gonna be certain rules that we're gonna to have to, to abide by in certain timelines that that we're gonna be asked to meet would it be fair to say that you guys haven't received clear guidance from the Washington DC office on this issue yet we're still awaiting the final guidance yes okay. all right thank you um, and then a follow-up on that <clears throat> getting back to CEQ guidelines and, and the NEPA is there any directive out there right now that mandates the number of alternatives that have to be considered underneath this EIS that's being done at the national level for these 128 forests. Does CEQ usually prescribe the number of alternatives that have to be analyzed associated with these, or what do you guys anticipate? Surely you're not doing a NEPA action with only one alternative. We've seen that with the Rock Springs RMP. I know you guys are a lot more well versed than that. So yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any CEQ regulations that are going to dictate how many um, alternatives will be looked at. So, but do you have any idea at the national level? I don't. We can, we can, you know, talk to the folks at the national level and get back with you, but I, I don't really have a good feel for that. You still don't have any clear guidance from Washington, D.C. on still what might be the range of alternatives for consideration under this environmental impact statement. Is that correct? That's correct. I Thank don't you. have that information. Yeah. Um, so just a couple of specific things that I wanted to get to. One of the commonalities that you guys have, and you get into the forest plan, particularly the BT, uh, MEDBO, with some of these other issues with some of the EIS level decisions is, um, we're now in a situation in many river basins within the Western United States to exacerbated drought. Um, you know, all the water starts on the Continental Divide. You're the biggest reservoir manager in the Western United States. And I'm just curious as when you get into these forest plans, I, I think from the state of Wyoming's perspective, we fully expect to be that as one alternative to use all the tools in your management prescription, including the use of water yield, given the fact that most of it drives off the national forest. My question is, how do you see that working in, in a multiple use prescription and how would you apply um, a water yield basically we're managing vegetation right i'm really concerned about past experiences with the with the agency using uh, ecas to constrain the ability to manage the forest for fuels and timber and water yield uh, moving forward how do you expect to address when we got 40 so here let me make a statement we always talk about urban interface. That's a big driver and motivation with forest service. In my perspective, when it comes to water, the urban interface, you have 44 million people that get their drinking water out of the Colorado River Basin. Your urban interface is Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Phoenix. That's where they all get their drinking water. So when are we gonna address that urban interface as far as the effects of forest management on that? Any idea? Um, another great question. 
and uh, I don't have a good answer for that downstream. You're right. You're talking about downstream effects in, on those communities and how we how we in, incorporate uh, our management upstream in the upper basin for the downstream effects. Uh, I, I have to get back to you on that, to be honest with you. I don't have a good yeah. But I understand your question. It's a good question, and I, I understand where you're coming from, certainly. And going back to the 19, or 1897 Organic Act, not only... That's where it starts. You know where I'm going, right? Reliable yeah. supply of... Timber and water. The timber and water. That's right. Yep. So anyway, so I would just tell you it's going to be a big issue as you get into these forest plans. So we might as well get it on the radar screen for your staff and maybe start looking at as we start to develop these and go out for public comment. I'm pretty sure there'll be at least one uh, committee and maybe the entire legislature is very interested in this subject. And so uh, we'll look forward to working with you guys on that. Um, just a couple other things. I know we still have to get to the BLM. Just one comment on the BT as somebody that spent a lot of time in the backcountry, and, and I hate to lodge, I'd like to be constructive criticism, but I just have nothing to say good about the maintenance on the backcountry trails. It's so frustrating when you take guests from out of state out on a pack trip and you go down a trail and you can't get down it. And there's no sign. You can't go to your website that says it hasn't been cleared in two years or 10 years. There's no information. So you just end up out there in a big pile of beetle kill and a nasty mess. And so I would really appreciate the fact if you would at least get a website up and post when those trails have last been, last been cleared. And they're a disaster, an absolute disaster. Now, I don't want to contrast one forest to the other, but it's always interesting to me as I ride my horse from the Shoshone National Forest onto the BT, the vast difference in the quality of the trail maintenance from one forest to the other. Maybe it's a regional issue, maybe it's a forest issue. I'm just telling you, there's nobody been back there and when you hit that forest boundary, it's kind of like a wall on a lot of those really high visited sites like the thoroughfare. So, it's a stark difference, gentlemen. It's somebody that knows where the boundary's at, but it's a criticism, and I, but it's real. So anyway, I, I would, this is an informational, you know, I'm asking you guys for some information associated with this and saying, look, these are some of the issues that are very important to us moving forward. Cooperating agency status, the water yield, how we're gonna address this carbon issue and the accumulation of fuels, they're all related. Water, fuel, and carbon, if you haven't noticed, all follow the same cycle. And you guys, you guys manage that cycle. I've, I'm going to have to go, but I'm gonna, I just want to say a couple other things. One is I want to congratulate you on one thing, and that is I do think you've finally uh, taken a, a, a hard line on invasive plants, and you've done a lot of work in that area. And we, you know, I'm, I'm, I serve on an invasive task force back home, and it's appreciated you've got clearances on most of the good chemicals and starting to be an active partner which i think is really important if we want to uh continue and i and i appreciate that i and then my final comment is you know whether whether it's this old growth attempt whether it was the uh frankly the blm's rock springs management plan which is to designate everything something else or whether it's the fact that we don't keep up our trails anymore so we can make it more remote so you can't get a horse down it, but you can go, there's a philosophy out there. And, uh, and it's concerning if you live in the West in these areas that people are making decisions that are gonna affect you and your neighbors forever. And that really there is a larger plan out there um, that, that will ultimately not be healthy for multiple use. Like I said, I don't believe in single use. I don't believe that one, one person should dominate the landscape, one use. I think there's room for all of us, but in order to do that, you gotta manage it. And sometimes I think maybe what's going on is it's easier to manage if you don't have any use on the landscape. So it's simpler if you, if you don't have the manpower, you don't have the will, you don't have whatever, maybe it's easier just to cut uses off because you don't have the you don't have the people, so I just encourage you to uh, think about who's and I know you do. I'm not. You guys live in these communities. Don't get me wrong. I'm not 
beating you up. I know you you care about about this as much or more than I do. But uh, the decisions you guys make and that could be made in the next eight years on these forests could be catastrophic to us that live there. Or it could be beneficial and we could have good partnerships. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'll second. <laughs> I got to run. All right. See y'all. See ya. BLM. And just for clarification, that does stand for the Bureau of Land Management, in case anybody's listening. <laughs> All right. Well, President Driscoll and members of the legislature, again, my name is Heidi Rogers. I am the forestry lead of the BLM Wyoming State Office. And we did have a few more folks sneak in. Our associate state director, Chris Kirby, is here this evening and also one of our branch chiefs, Mark Bortel. Um, I appreciate the invitation to appear before you today to provide information about BLM Wyoming's forestry and fuels program and forest conditions on BLM managed lands across the state. BLM Wyoming has significant forest resources in the state. The forestry program is actively managing them for long-term health, resiliency, and local economic opportunities. All of our field forest Forester positions in the state have been filled for over a year, along with the state lead position that was filled in July of 2023. This is the first time in several years that all positions have been filled. Based on a fiscal year 2022 Department of Interior and BLM economic analysis, the BLM forestry program provided $2.7 million in direct and indirect contributions to Wyoming's economy. Fiscal year 20. Uh, three reports have not been published at this time. In fiscal year 24, the forest management budget in the state received the same funding levels as for fiscal year 23. Additionally, we were able to compete for additional funding specifically for forest salvage and forest health restoration projects. BLM Wyoming is also currently working on bipartisan infrastructure law uh, funded restoration landscape scale projects funded in fiscal year 23. For fiscal year 24 bill funding, we're currently under active contract for fuels reduction forestry projects in Crook and Weston counties. Fuels forestry projects were recently completed in the Southern Bighorns and we are preparing to implement projects in the Muddy Creek and Labarge restoration landscape areas, including native seed collection and invasive species management. Fiscal year 2023, BLM Wyoming offered 4 million board feet and sold 4 million board feet. Our fiscal year 24 target is to offer 4.5 million board feet of timber per year as a byproduct of our forest health and fuels reduction treatments. This year we are set to offer approximately 4.5 million of timber statewide meeting BLM Wyoming targets. BLM Wyoming sells thousands of cords of firewood for personal and commercial use each year and treats thousands of acres of forested land to reduce hazardous fuels and restore and improve forest health each year. Using the Good Neighbor Authority in conjunction with Wyoming State Forestry, we have implemented numerous projects across boundaries, allowing for management at landscape scales and improving accessibility to forest resources and products. For the last several years, we have been offering the sale of firewood and Christmas tree permits online. The public has generally responded positively to the convenience this system offers, and we have approximately doubled the number of permits we have been selling annually since the program was launched. We are currently having record sales of both Christmas trees and fuel wood. On Bureau Managed Forests, we continue to see large amounts of defoliation from Western Spruce Budworm going into the fifth year of that outbreak. We have also observed increased mortality from spruce beetle and Douglas fir beetle, possibly linked to trees stressed from drought and defoliation. White bark pine protection. Uh, white bark pine was listed in December 2022 as a threatened species by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. BLM Wyoming is actively creating strategies to protect and enhance white bark pine habitat, along with streamlining the consultation process to continue to implement management and habitat enhancement projects. 
This year we met with entomologist Kurt Allen from the Forest Service Forest Health Protection who studied and reported findings on the ongoing work in the Southern Bighorns. We were able to secure $150,000 in funding from the Forest Health Protection to continue addressing the spruce budworm outbreak. In fiscal year 23, the BLM Wyoming Fuels Management Program treated 153,000 acres of public lands, including uh, 9,500 acres treated in the forest and woodland ecosystem. The primary objectives include reducing conifer encroachment within aspen stands and in sagebrush, forest thinning to increase forest health and vigor, and reducing the fuel load in order to decrease wildfire risk and severity, restoring riparian areas and improving habitat for species, including mule deer, elk, bighorn sheep, and greater sage grouse. To accomplish this, we use a variety of techniques, including hand thinning, mastication, prescribed fire, and timber sales. The BLM looks forward to continued work with our state and federal partners and private industry to manage towards a healthy, productive, fire resistant, and sustainable forest. Partnerships and inclusion are vital to managing sustainable working public lands. Thank you for having me here to speak with you today. The BLM appreciates maintaining direct communications with all of you. And I'm pleased to answer any further questions the committee may have. Got any questions? Very much question. Just a comment and a thank you. Uh, for all of you, we're pretty dang hard on you. We're, we'll do some more questions, but I'd like to thank all of you for the dedication you do, and you know the that end of it. Sometimes it gets to, to looking like the world's there. And uh, I've been sitting here thinking back a little of, of what I said, and I'm I'm probably delivering the, the message a little too harsh to the wrong people, but. Uh, the frustration is absolutely incredible out there, folks. It's, it's hard and it's really hard. And I, I could see it with Speaker Summers when you live in it, you live it every day and comments get weighed the same to someone else that's never been there, got their hands dirty or been a part of it. And when you folks get those, and I don't know how you weigh comments or how you do them, but it's unbelievable. I mean, I read through a lot of your comments and it's someone that obviously lives in another state that's never visited my forest. That's been sent one of these deals through the deal that guys like people I love in my area that have managed things for sustainability for not years, but generations uh, are treated exactly the same as somebody that, that's never been there, never seen it, used another information. And uh, like I say, I, I really implore you to figure that out. And if if there's a way we can help you folks, I, I'd like to do that because I I run into this often with, with deals like this. I'm passionate about it. And it's, I'm telling you, tears roll down your face when you drive through a forest and it's dead. And I know that my grandkids are going to see it just getting started good. And when I look to the timbered areas where I live, it's black and white between private timber and forest timber. And I'd love to tell you that the forest who has the biggest blocks and the best timber was the best managed. And I think there's some lessons to be learned by looking outside of where you're at at some of it. And also the, the fear that we're absolutely gonna overcut it. This isn't mining a mineral or oil and gas is if we make an error, the error should be made in the fact that we kept the forest alive and we have something to work from that doesn't take an extra generation to start it. And that's really heart, heartfelt advice to you because we've actually, our, our generation age has got to see this firsthand that you're going to deal with this for a number of years here because we've all lived it in our lifetime and I don't have to convince the kids around me because they've driven across the bighorns for a hundred miles that there's hardly anything other than pockets of live trees. So for me and, and Senator Hicks addressed it, my God, we've got the best carbon sequestration source ability, maybe in North America. And we can either cut a tree down and put it in the house or put it in this that it doesn't emit carbon for a hundred years or we can manage it to lay on the ground and actually be a 
part of it. And the forest fire ends is the same. It's absolutely devastating to start talking about honest carbon sequestration and carbon emissions and act like forest fires don't play a major part. And we talked earlier about the act of God. They are act of gods, but management has an effect on what that act of God is. As one, one act of God on a poorly managed place means a million burnt acres, and another act of God on a managed forest might be a 25,000 acre grass fire. And we've seen that with the 10 million Wyoming put in. I, uh, I don't know how well Kelly can address it. I know Bill Crapser could. Uh, that little bit of money that we spent, I believe there's been seven or eight fires in Wyoming now that have burned up to those managed areas, dropped to the ground and, and have not become catastrophe wildfires. And I don't think anybody's ever talked to a meeting I've heard about, about what the value of those, and, and I'm not talking just easy money, I'm talking the, that end of it. And that's something we all got to address. That, that was one question I didn't get asked. I went, what percentage of your entire budget now from 1970s to now is dedicated to fire management because there's people in my area that are making their living off fire. There's probably many making living off firefighting as there is off the timber industry right now. Do, do you guys have numbers on that? So I don't have the specific numbers, um, Senator, but we can get that for you. But I do know that it's dramatic. It's the majority of funding in the Forest Service goes to fight wildfire. Um, and that's part of the reason um, over the last few years, you know, our agencies push um, around the wildfire crisis strategy. And um, with some of the investments that we've received through the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act um, to reduce our wildfire risk, um, you know, those funds, they're not enough to address, to, to get ahead of the problem, but, but the idea there is, you know, money spent in, in managing the forest and reducing the risk, that's money saved um, on the suppression side. Um, Can you give us homes. just a minute or two of what they're actually doing on that? Are they, are they cutting trees or are they buying fire trucks? For the, so we're, we're cutting, so it depends on where you're at. Um, there's everything from mechanical treatment, so cutting trees um, to uh, prescribed fire, to invasives work, um, there, there's a full suite of um, investments sure. um, on the on the landscape. There's also money that's um, being directed to the um, wildfire. I'm going to get the acronym wrong, but community defense Great. grants, and 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 so to, to help um, communities um, that and you know, homeowners associations that are in the wild and urban interface to um, reduce you know their risk and and help safeguard them if a wildfire was in their vicinity. So. I'm still so back, back to that probably one last one. What, what's the cost of acre treatment cost between an area that has no sawmill and one that has a sawmill? So it definitely you, affects. Rough numbers. I've seen numbers that are they're hundred times. Yeah. So I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. I don't know if my colleague from the Rocky Mountain region does, but it, it definitely um, affects the tools that we can use. Um, and it definitely affects the cost, uh, which sometimes cost can be prohibitive um, to be able to do the, the work that we need to do. Have you considered at all about paying sawmills to be part of the fire management so that you actually have something there? Because that, that's a concern of mine. I've watched it so in our area, you know, we lost the Hill City Mill. Now there's no cost effective management in that area. I live at Hewlett, uh, we lose that mill my, my forest on my place, which I, I can't tell you exactly, but I'm guessing I'm looking around 7,000 forested acres on my place. The minutes mill and Hewlett closes, my acres just went from a merchantable product that has value to my family and my ranch to a noxious weed. I'm gonna be honest with you. If I can't make money off of it, pine trees make no difference to me at all. Other than I wanna keep enough of them so the tourists will take pictures. Other than that, I don't care. <laughs> but it, it, it really is interesting is, you know, we've paid off ranches in our family and we've paid off old people. And, and I'm in fear of that. I'm one of the old people in my family. And, you know, that's part of our planning was having one last cup. I got into my 70s and I don't think we're going to have it. So, President Distrom, we need to kind of move on. Maybe. Are you, yeah. 
Maybe. So it, we still have the BLM. Did you have any questions? Yeah, well, yeah. For, just, for BLM? just a comment. I, I think the forests have been managed for forest fires for the past 50 years in my mind. And um, our national forests are that way. I hadn't really thought about it, but I guess we've created a, a new industry of forest firefighters. But that isn't, that isn't necessarily good. And your costs are high because these forests haven't been managed and timber's been taken out of the equation. There's just too much fuel there and you can't stop it. So um, that would be my comments on why your costs are so high on forest fires. It's not your fault, it's just that's the deal. So Heidi, I do have a question for you. Are you ready? <laughs> so, and I appreciate the fact you guys got foresters in, in uh, every district now. That's helpful right up to what's not. So let me explain what that statement means. Is, is, so it's great to have people out there, but oftentimes when you drop a brand new forester in an area they've never been in, um, they're a little comfortable to make any decisions because they don't know what's out there. And so rather than going out and managing the landscape, they want to inventory the landscape. And we have a little situation in Carbon County where I believe you guys received $10 million for a national priority area through Interior. It's, a, it's one of the great mule deer, sage grouse areas, and now we're being prohibited or reduced the ability to go out and treat uh, encroaching junipers into core sage grouse habitat. You know, we had massive winter kill last year with our mule deer. Again, maybe some additional work in junipers would have provided more food. We've got all the shelter we need. And now we're in a process that we've got declining aspen, and particularly on BLM ground. And what I'm hearing is now, well, we need to go inventory. And, you know, it'd take two or three years with a consultant to go out and inventory. You don't have to drive very far out of town to figure out that the aspen's declining and what the problem is. It's a disturbance-based ecology, and whether you either do it with fire or mechanical, we have a declining aspen cuny, and in those foothill areas, uh, you know, that the BLM manages, which is our crucial winter range, um, our sage grouse core habitat, um, we're being, uh, I would say we, we're being we're precluded from being able to treat those areas because we have new foresters and I'm not trying to disparage them. I get it when you come into a new area. But at some point in time, you have a whole wealth of knowledge there that we can't allow one individual with particular discipline, forestry, stop the thousands and thousands of acres that we need to be treating. You know, we just gone through this big sage grouse EIS you guys did. You know, we're worried about the listing of sage grouse in Wyoming. And then we come up and say, well, you really can't treat juniper trees that are encroaching into core sage grouse habitat. That's kind of a little tough bill for us to swallow. I need your help to cite getting some of these projects rolled out from aspen treatments to juniper treatments, because quite frankly, when we you're the habitat manager. And when the habitat manager is more interested in inventory than, than getting back to the treatments, I think that's the whole discussion we've had here right now. We're in a crisis situation and we can't wait for to inventory every aspen patch when anybody that's ever walked through a timber stand in their life knows what declining aspen looks like. And so it would be very helpful to enlist your assistance to help move this on, that there's plenty of opportunity to do treatments while we do inventory, but we shouldn't stop everything while we're trying to inventory. We don't have the time. So I would look forward to your help on that issue. Um, yes, Senator, I will look into that. And um, also, I will say the forester out of the Rollins field office has been there for about 11, 12 years. It's not one of our new new foresters and so her and I have also recently been talking um, about ways of, of moving forward with that and one of the ways is we have a national salvage implementation team referred to as NSIT is their acronym and when they're not working on 
um, salvage timber sales. They, um, they can do stand exams, they can do inventories, but we're looking to get them out here to help us with this project. Um, quickly. Quickly, sir. Quickly. Because here's the deal, and you guys all know you're under pressure. You've been bombarded with money from Bill and Ira and all this other stuff, and there's a real expectation from Congress that something's actually going to happen on the ground. I'd sure hate to go back and report to Congress that we would have loved to have treated all these thousands of acres of junipers and restored our aspen habitat, but we were just too busy using that money to inventory stuff. I don't think that's what the intent of Congress was. And so regardless of whatever the forester has been there, it's become an impediment. And so they could use your assistance to try to address this issue so we can move some of their fuels projects too. So again, it's interrelated, interdependent. It all ties back together. So anyway, appreciate if you could help me work on that issue. So that's yes. pretty important down there. So um, with that, I would, do uh, you have any more questions? I do appreciate you guys coming. And sometimes, you know, it takes a tough discussion. And, you know, we always look at it, we call them our federal partners for a reason, because this is a state that's about 50% under federal management. And it's, you guys know as well as I do, collectively, we can manage landscapes. Managing down a fence line into jurisdiction doesn't work very good for things like fire and water, and wildlife and grazing permits and public access and recreation. So we're going to only going to be able to skin this thing with a true partner. So I look for thank you guys for showing up tonight. Uh, I would open it up if we've got a limited time here. I'd like to open it up if there is any public here that would have any questions that they would like to ask. Uh, if there is, uh, I'd entertain questions from the public. Any questions? I guess they're uh, waiting to get the heck out of here. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for coming, and we look forward to a continuing dialogue, I think, with some of this, uh, this new EIS on the uh, old growth stuff, forest plans. Um, we're going to have a lot of discussions over the next few years. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. See you. <laughs>